The chapter our reading comes from today is basically wall-to-wall -wall woes. For the whole of Matthew 23, Jesus just rips on the hypocrisy of religious leaders. You scribes and Pharisees major in the minor things and neglect the most important things like justice and mercy. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it in his message version. He has Jesus saying, you're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. From the very beginning, Matthew's whole agenda is having Jesus emphasize the love command. It's all about compassion, love, and empathy. In fact, right before Matthew 23, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is. And he distills his whole message into love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, that's it. But people still don't get it, especially religious people. And religious people in Jesus' day didn't either. That's why the people Matthew casts as Jesus' primary opponents are the most overtly religious. Folks who apply scripture in a legalistic and bureaucratic way that assumes God is some kind of angry, thin-skinned control freak. As my teacher Bill Loader puts it, the problem is, for many folks, God is essentially their own egos writ large. And when that happens, people will be abused in the name of purity or holiness or obedience. In every generation, we can find examples of destructiveness done in the name of Scripture or even by means of Scripture. The challenges of chapter 23 have a way of coming home to roost. Sadly, each of the charges Matthew has Jesus make in chapter 23 is just as applicable to the Christian community today as it was to a first century Jewish community. We're talking a basic shortcoming of the human condition. People like to justify their own prejudices and preferences by attributing them to some divine source. Hey, don't blame me. I'm just following the rules as laid out by God. Our words of wisdom are from Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisee, hypocrites! For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. A couple of pastors are standing together by the side of a road holding up an improvised sign that reads, Turn back! The end is near! A man driving by reads their sign and just accelerates, thinking to himself, religious nuts. What a waste of energy. Seconds later, the pastors cringe at the sound of a squealing brakes and a loud splash. One of them turns to the other and says, Maybe the sign should be more specific, like, warning, bridge out ahead. <laughs> we've all thought it before, haven't we? We've seen some Christians' actions or read what they're advocating and thought, religious nuts, what a waste of energy. Or worse, we know for a fact that their actions or words are advocating for or creating division or harm so frustrating. That's just one of the reasons for the precipitous drop in the number of Americans who are not only no longer a part of the church, but who are deconstructing their faith altogether. In one way or another, 
they've all had a front row seat to how so-called Christians put love on the back burner in favor of judgment, guilt, taking sides, condemnation, turning one's back on people who need help, threats of violence, and fear-mongering. It's no wonder one of the most popular memes out there today is, there's no hate like Christian love. But this is nothing new. There have always been those who've resisted the status quo of conventional Christianity. We're here today as Methodists because the followers of the Wesley brothers broke too many of the rules of Anglicanism to stay a part of that particular denomination. But few people have articulated this urge to shed the burden of Christian doctrine and dogma as clearly as Lutheran pastor and anti-Nazi activist Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've talked about Bonhoeffer before and how he worked to oppose the state-controlled church, the Nazi regime, and everything so many of his fellow Germans seemed to blithely go along with. While most of his pastor colleagues just went along with Hitler's priorities, Bonhoeffer believed that true discipleship demanded resistance, both religious and political, including, in pacifist Bonhoeffer's case, an attempt to assassinate Hitler. Imprisoned and eventually executed by the Gestapo for his resistance, he wrote letters and essays from prison which have continued to inspire generations of frustrated Christians. And in light of the depravity of the Nazi state and the horrific violence of the war, his attention was often focused on what, if anything, did Christianity even mean anymore? With German Christians so captive to their culture, not protesting the persecution of Jews and unwilling to stand up against evil and unjust laws, what does religion even mean anymore? Is it just irrelevant or downright complicit with evil? German Christians blithely confessed doctrinally correct beliefs, observed the church's moral codes, and followed the accepted behaviors and practices of the church while simultaneously committing unspeakable horrors. Can you hear Bonhoeffer using Jesus' woes? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of uncleanness. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So, Bonhoeffer wondered, what would Christianity look like if it was stripped of all the regalia and ornaments? What would remain if the typical trappings of religion, clergy, rites, holy things, beliefs, and morality, were eliminated. What would a religionless Christianity look like? He came to the conclusion that it would be just two things, contemplative prayer and righteous action. That's it. But what exactly would that look like? Well, first off, don't confuse today's understanding of contemplative centering prayer with what Bonhoeffer had in mind. We're not talking about focusing on inner peace and tranquility, but the exact opposite. Bonhoeffer's idea of prayer was about moving beyond ourselves into the lives of others. When Bonhoeffer prayed, he said, I move into the other person's place. I enter their life, their guilt and distress. I am afflicted by their sins and their infirmity. In other words, contemplative prayer for Bonhoeffer was about opening one's heart and letting oneself be moved with compassion for others. So, 
If your prayers sound more like you're reminding God what God's job is, to bring peace among nations, to bring healing to the sick, to be with those who suffer, etc., then Bonhoeffer would like to have a little conversation with you. Because he believed, as do I, that whoever or whatever this divine purveyor of love and compassion is at the center of our faith, it is only able to make an impact in the world through us. Likewise, we need to be clear about what Bonhoeffer means by righteous action. For many, righteous means being morally right or following all of God's rules to the letter. That's why so many religious people are totally insufferable to be around. But what Bonhoeffer was referring to was not being right, but standing up for what is right and seeking justice by acting on behalf of those suffering from injustice. And what do you know? As it turns out, that's one of the core values of the whole Bible. Isaiah is just one example of prophets and teachers throughout the Bible who tried to bring God's vision to the people, often with little success. But consistently, across the board, they proclaimed one message over and over again, and it's not about religion. God says this, rather than religion, is the practice that I wish. Releasing those bound unjustly, untying the thongs of the yoke, setting free the oppressed, breaking every yoke, sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn. Your wound shall quickly be healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. Friends, a religionless Christianity would take the words of Isaiah seriously. It would honor the witness of Jesus' life and teachings, and it would transform the idea of being a Christian from affirming the correct belief system to imitating Jesus, seeking justice, practicing kindness, and loving your neighbor as yourself. In short, it would move us away from practicing the gospel about Jesus towards practicing the gospel of Jesus. Embracing those who are excluded, caring for the hurting, responding in concrete ways to not only heal the wounds of life, but alleviate the causes of suffering for real people in the real world. Granted, this kind of behavior has supposed to have been a part of the church's mission all along, but the institution often becomes more concerned about itself than its core mission. Why? As Karen Armstrong observes, religious people often prefer to be right rather than compassionate. Often, they don't want to give up their egotism. They want their religion to endorse their ego, their identity. In other words, they want God to endorse their already held prejudices and worldview to put a little religious shinola on the status quo. Maybe do a little charity work here and there, tithing that mint and cumin so we can feel good about ourselves, but don't rock the boat. But as we've already heard, Jesus has just one thing to say to such ideas. Woe to you. The prophets and Jesus alike offer us one consistent biblical theme. God values justice and mercy over empty religious rituals and hypocrisy. But that ancient message and example of Jesus has become muted and distorted, both in our churches 
and in the public arena. The church has not only domesticated Jesus into a figure that's all about one's own personal faith, but has transformed him into a figure who is harmless and irrelevant to the principalities and powers shaping the world. As our guide to being people of the way, Kurt Struckmeyer writes, Jesus set out to transform human life in the midst of a great empire and to challenge those forces that oppress and divide people in every society. This is the journey Jesus invites us to join. This is where Jesus is leading us. We have to let go of our preconceived ideas about Christianity, especially the seductive and self-serving dogma that makes Christianity all about us. If we can reclaim the Jesus of history, the human Jesus, we can reshape a Christianity stripped of its religious trappings and emphasize what Jesus modeled and Bonhoeffer advocated. Not more religion, but the kind of prayer and action that transforms the world for the good of all. As Pastor Bruxy Cavi has preached, Jesus didn't come to offer an alternative religion, but an alternative to religion. He didn't call people to leave one lifeless shell for another, but to live life beyond the borders of religious rules, regulations, rituals, and routines. As Bonhoeffer wrote, Jesus does not call us to a new religion, but to life. Jesus asked just one thing of us, follow me, walk with me toward the vision I'm proclaiming, the revolutionary reign of God, this conspiracy of love. It's not about getting the religion right. It's about advocating for the marginalized and oppressed. It's about respecting and learning from others. It's about embracing our common humanity and shared values and focusing on what transformative action we can take together in the world. Will what we do in our little corner of the world revive Christianity? Will it make Christianity suddenly relevant to the disenchanted? Will we bring an end to hypocrisy, evil, violence, and injustice in the world? Probably not. But as that bit of religionless Jewish wisdom reminds us, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work but neither are you free to abandon it. My hope is that the prayer and actions you decide to take will transcend traditional religious boundaries and make the Pharisees in your life very, very uncomfortable, just like Jesus did. Be well.